So, um, I was in a conversation um, earlier this week uh, um, with you, actually, and, and, and he, he asked me, so what is it, why do companies hire you? And I'm like, well, I solve problems. He said, well, lots of people do. And then I was like, good question, actually. What kind of problems do I actually solve? Well, two, actually, I figured out over the last 10 years. One is called technical death. Not depth, but death, right? So companies that are unable to move further. And the other one is actually how to pass on beyond the innovator's dilemma. Um, even if you don't know the innovator's dilemma, you might be in the um, dilemma zone, actually. But I'm going to try to explain that to you. So I think we should start with a little talk about quality. And you're like, quality, that's boring. It is, of course, I know. But I'm going to try to make it as less boring as possible. And the interesting thing is about software doesn't work the way the rest of society works, right? So if you go to the supermarket, in my case, the Albert Heijn, um, and you buy coffee, and you could buy the Albert Heijn brand for like, uh, what is it these days, 100 euros per pack or something. Um, it's really expensive these days to drink coffee. So it's like 10 euros, right? But if I buy a better brand, a more well-known brand, a higher quality coffee, better burned from this more distant countries, the price goes up. So with quality, the price goes up. It's the same with if you buy a car, right? Not specifically this brand, but any brand. It's, uh, the more features you want it, the higher the quality you want, the more expensive it is, right? That is why a Fiat is less expensive than an Audi, for instance, right? Just, well, that's sorry if you have a Fiat, but um, <laughs> I was trying to find a brand that nobody owns anymore these days, right? So um, anyway, so, so, and the nice thing is, actually, when you buy something, you do basically this. So you can go up to a really high quality at high, really high cost. Most people will actually try to find the optimum where the cost is lowest and the quality is just good enough. That's usually how we buy products. And the interesting thing is, if you talk about software, it's quite different. Because at software, quality can mean many, 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 many things, right? It could be any one of these things ending in IT or whatever, IT or installability, full tolerance, it doesn't have it, full tolerance ability, um, recovery, et cetera, et cetera. This all is covered in what is called quality. That makes quality in tech and software development actually really hard. It makes it rather intangible. And the question is, what do we do with quality? And people say, yeah, you have to write tests and la, 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 la. No, that's not the point. Well, it is a point, though, but not the point I'm trying to make. Is the interesting thing is, if you build something really quickly, it sort of works. You can put it out there. It's OK. If it's one of software, then you're good. The problem is, that is usually not the case. And that is where software becomes interesting. Because in the short run, quick and dirty is actually cheaper, right? And, uh, and then, well, the quality isn't as good as we want it or as it should be, but it works and we can get it out. We can get the first version of our app into the App Store. Cool, right? And then you come to the realization that if you have to maintain this software for a much longer time, um, say 30 years, you might think, 30 years? Do we actually have software in this world that is already live for 30 years? Yes, we do. Most large companies depend on it, basically, right? If you're a bank or an insurance company or a government agency, the youngest software you have is about 10 years old, in production, that is, right? So, and the nice thing is, if you have to maintain it for a much longer time, quality comes into play much more, right? You have to figure out what it means to have higher quality. And the nice thing is, in software, actually, when you look at quality, if you build higher quality software, still you have to find the balance. Actually, in the long run, it, that is cheaper than just building it quick and dirty. So where's the balance? And if you look at this, there's one interesting aspect that comes to mind. And that is, of course, technical debt, right? We all, do you have technical debt? Do you think you have technical debt? We all do, right? Nobody tried to dare raise their hands because they're afraid I'm going to ask questions about the specific, I'm not. So technical debt. So if you look into technical debt, the phrase was coined by Ward Cunningham, the inventor of the wiki, um, uh, and one of the signees of the Agile Manifesto. And he has, well, basically shipping first time code is like going into debt, right? A little debt speeds up development. So a little less test or no test at all, as we've been done, doing for years. So I started writing software in 1978. Um, we didn't have unit tests, right? We didn't have the internet, basically, so that made stuff a lot easier, but um, uh, I, I, although I had to learn from a book, basically. but So a little depth speeds up the development, which is good in the short run. But in the long run, this stuff can bite your ass. So he says, the danger occurs when the debt is not repaid. 
right? When you leave it into the code, when you leave it into the test, when you write your code more sloppy than you probably would or should. And then he says, entire engineering organizations can be brought to a standstill under the depth load of unfractured uh, uh, implementation, object-oriented or otherwise. So if you do functional programming or if you do even older programming, like you're a co is anybody a COBOL programmer here? Really? Oh, that's cool, right? Cool. Now, I'm not going to make any jokes about COBOL now, so I have to pick on Java, right? Um, anyway, so, so you can get into terrible depth. And that goes worse and worse and worse. I'll give you some real life examples from my own experience. So I was working for this insurance company about a decade ago, um, and they had these two really, really big systems. One of them was 18 million lines of COBOL. And the other one was 12 million lines of Java. And you can debate which one is worse, I'm not going to, but the problem was that they sat on legacy infrastructure, or legacy machines, actually, that were standing in the basement of this insurance company. And that costed a million euros per year just to maintain it. They couldn't upgrade the operating system anymore because it was so old that nobody knew how. So they started a program to rewrite these 30 million lines of code. And they didn't start it once, they started it six times. Each attempt took two years. They all failed, right? That is when you get into trouble because there's no way ahead. And the problem was that their developers sort of like, well, they had to write this particular code, right? This is a COBOL uh, dialect. Uh, it's, it's, it's worse because everything is abbreviated because, well, otherwise it doesn't fit. It's also in Dutch. That doesn't really help, right? And if your programmers get older and older, which we tend to do, so what do you do, right? So they got into big troubles. They're out of it by now, by the way, but uh, that's like years later. So this is my current client. I'll show you a bit of their current landscape when we came in. So um, they have customer-facing stuff, as everybody does, and then they have a whole lot of systems. Well, it's circle here is a system that they maintain for years and years and years, and grow and grow and grow organically, right? Uh, and then they have some microservices, because everybody needs some microservices. Um, they have every infrastructure you can think of, and lots of parties that they can need to communicate with. Because they added all this stuff organically over the years, what happened is that the data got spread everywhere, right? So the customer accounts were in the CMS system, as an example. I'm not, I'm not joking, this is actually true, right? Um, but because the data was everywhere, they also need to copy it everywhere, which means, well, they sort of got the data in sync everywhere, and it's like, and this is it, basically, right? If this is your landscape, what do you do? And the problem here is that they ran into what I call technical death. That is basically the point in time where the time that you have available to do new development, add new features, release stuff, is gone. Because all the time, you need to keep the stuff running. If you are here, what do you do? They hadn't released their mobile app for two and a half years when I came down, right? Um, that is, as an e-commerce company, that's, you're doomed, basically, right? So these kinds of issues, and that is, besides the innovator's dilemma, because that makes it even worse. And I'll show you what the innovator's dilemma is. It's basically this guy. So if you are building a product, a service whatsoever, usually software, you're somewhere on the curve here, right? You start building it, you add more features, people pick it up, you get more popular, more popular, you add more features and more features and more features up till the point in time that nobody additionally buys your product anymore. So what do you do then? By that point in time, other companies will have come into your market, either with newer technology or with better business ideas, and they will pick up from here. They also, by the way, go into the same graph. So the problem is, when you are in the dilemma zone, you need to basically reinvent yourself. Because the current product is not going to sell more, and other people are catching up. You go bankrupt. One of my previous clients actually ceased to exist because of this. They built the first smart thermostat in the world, I think, uh, and they added all sorts of features onto it, and they could add even more, right? They added weather information on it. Okay, that's explainable. And then they started adding traffic information onto a smart thermostat that was on the wall with a display in your, in your house, right? Traffic, okay, barely useful, but they spent a lot of time on doing that. They didn't gain any more customers, and eventually they get that out of business because, well, Google came in and all the other ones came. The question is, if you run into all of these problems, what do you do? Well, then uh, you hire me. 
or somebody else, right? So for that matter. So this is my introduction. This is me, and this is my girlfriend, Kim. Uh, we're on a stage here somewhere. And um, what I do is, well, I'm an independent dad. One of my kids is in the room. Yesterday, there were two. Um, I speak a bit. I write a bit. I travel a lot. Um, and basically, I'm a lifelong programmer. I've been writing code since 1978, more or less. And I still write code every day. I've been writing code this morning, even, because I was in the office. So that's what I do. Currently, I am the CTO for this really nice company called iBoot, which is an e-commerce company. A lot of you in the Netherlands will actually know it probably. Um, we actually won the overall website of the year award last year. And I was at the ceremony. I didn't know we would win. Nobody knew, actually, because we didn't pay for it, actually. Um, I asked the CEO, oh, did, we, did we pay for it? He said, no, I didn't know it either. Oh, that's kind of cool, right? So we won, basically. Doesn't say anything, but it's pretty cool if you've been working there for a couple of years. So just to explain to you that I'm a programmer, this is my name, and as you can see, I'm actually double object-oriented. Uh, it gets worse, because I live in the Java Street, which, <laughs> which is in four kilometers from here, so uh, this is from my room, actually, which is kind of cool. Also, uh, I maintain a, an open source project called, called Easy, which is a uh, TypeScript framework for doing microservices. So that's the intro, right? So, oh, one more thing. The things I'm sharing with you is the stuff that works for us. That doesn't necessarily mean it works for you too, right? It means, well, it worked for us, basically, that's it. So, what do we do? So, we need to get away from this innovator's dilemma and beyond the technical debt and make sure that stuff gets going again. That's basically it, right? But additional to that, we have the additional problem that as an e-commerce company or as an insurance company or as a smart energy company, you cannot just stop everything and say, well, listen, we're going to be out for the next year and then we're going to rebuild everything because you need to keep the shop open while you are reconstructing. And if you think that just building new software is hard, this is much harder because it means you need to keep in touch with the old software all the time. We actually wrote a whole bunch of Debezium triggers that look at the changes in the old databases and see how we can end them up in our microservices landscape now. That makes it tough, basically. So anyway, so what do we do? Well, there's only one way out. That is to take small steps. Because, as you probably all know, is that every complex system that is alive always started as a small system. Anybody who tried to build a big system from scratch has failed so far in this industry, right? There's a lot of research after, especially government projects that are usually like this big, uh, and they all fail, right? They're too big. You cannot just build a complex system from scratch. You have to do it step by step. And doing it step by step, there's a very good reason for that. And the reason is basically, well, we're very well explained in this framework. Do you know this thing? It's the Kinefin framework, right? It's a cool framework. Um, it has a bunch of zones in it. One of the zones says, in a clear context, if you have a problem and there is a best practice, just go out and do that, right? So in my house, if the dishes are on the sink, I can either say to some, please put the dishes in the sink. Some's my daughter, she's in the first row. Or I can do it myself. Usually the simple solution is I do it myself. So I, my, my other son still hasn't figured out where the dishwasher is. It's basically below where he puts the stuff on the sink. But anyway, so just do the best practice. Done, right? So then you have the situations that you get into the complicated zone where there is a bunch of good, pro good solutions to stuff, right? If you do identity access management, well, you can go either to Microsoft, to Google, to Amazon, to Okta, to whoever, right? Uh, just don't build it yourself. I tried. Um, <laughs> it's not a good idea, basically, but you can just do some analysis, choose one, implement that, done, right? And you're, you're good. That is also fairly simple. You can do that, by the way, still in a waterfall process if you want to. But then you get to the left side of the diagram. You either get into the complex or in the chaotic zones. If you are in a complex zone with a certain problem, that means there is no good practice yet. That means somebody has to invent that stuff. And then it will slowly emerge. And that is tough, right? Because if you don't know what the practices will be, how do you go on? So this talk is a lot about practices, basically. It gets worse. If you're in the chaotic zone, there is nobody who's done it before, right? Nobody knows. If you have, you become the CTO for an insurance company, and they say, well, we have 30 million lines of code, all legacy, and we need to get rid of it. I have no idea how to do that, right? We have to guess, basically. And that is what you need to do. You need to basically guess what, what the direction is. Hopefully, there's some sort of direction. Usually not, right? 
And now the nice thing is, or the terrible thing is in this industry, the bad news for today is we are mostly on the left side of this diagram, right? If you are on the right side of the diagram, you wouldn't be here. You would be copying somebody else's code who has done it before, right? That is not in this industry. We are usually on the left side. That is also why this industry is so fascinating to me, right? Um, and then the question is, so what do you do if you're on the left side of the diagram? Well, Liz has some nice answers to that. She says, well, basically, if you look at into these zones, there's different questions that you can ask, right? So if, you, if we all know how to do this, you're clearly on the right side of the diagram, right? If somebody in our team has done it, you're still on the right side of the diagram. So if somebody in your organization has done it, you can go out and ask. You're still on the right side of the diagram, except for the two on the bottom, right? Maybe somebody's done it somewhere, but not in this context. So you could get some information. You can ask Chet, right, our new good friend. Um, or if nobody's done it before, you're even in deeper shit. This is where you have to do one thing. And um, Dave Snowden, the inventor of this framework, he basically says, well, I'm not going to read the long one, but he basically says, if you are in the chaotic domain, it's nearly always the best place to do innovation. And how do you do innovation? You experiment. So this is where you need to be. You need to be in the era of doing experiments. By the way, Wikipedia says a an experiment is a test done in order to learn something or to discover something works or is true. That is the problem, right? We need to be able to experiment. That takes a lot of things, basically. Um, and, and that is what we try to manage with, with, with the teams I worked with in the last, say, decade. So what do we do? Well, we take small steps. So small steps in which directions? I figured out four. And I'm going to look into most of them, actually, today. So you need to stop doing projects, because projects are too big, right? You cannot just replace 30 million lines of code at once. You have to break it down. So how do you do that? Also, we're going to run into even shorter cycles. If you're, who of you is doing Scrum? Oh, god. You people never learn, right? It's like, but I'll, I'll show you why. <laughs> so, um, and then we're going to do this with smaller teams, and we're going to build smaller components. So everything becomes smaller, all to enable you to do smaller steps and to be able to experiment. It's much easier to experiment if you can break stuff a little bit down than if you say, oh, I need to go out and build the internet again, right? That doesn't really work. So let's go through them. Smaller features. So the thing with smaller features is it enables you to get from the chaotic domain into the complex domain. The difference between the two is whether or not you have any direction. So the first thing I do when I go to a new client is I basically ask them, what's your strategy? Where do you want to be in three to five years' time, right? So I went to the smart energy company that, that doesn't exist anymore. I'm like, what is your strategy? What do you want to be in five years? We want to be... Um, a smart energy company that sells to bigger companies and B2B stuff like that. They couldn't do that, basically. It was doomed from the start. So um, I'll show you the ones that we currently have at iBoot, right? So um, this is what we are puzzling with, right? But it's a lot of, it looks like marketing sentences. They basically are. But the nice thing is about having a strategy, in this case, breaking it down into five different parts, as tech, it gives us direction. Right? Because they're saying, like, iBoot is Europe's leading deal site. We're not there yet. I have no idea which one it is now, but um, it differs from day to day, basically. But that does mean we need to go out into Europe. What does that mean? That does mean we need to do multilingual. It does mean we need to do multi country, multi shop, la 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 la. The current landscape could not do that. Right? So we needed to change that. Also, there's apparently a community, so we need to do stuff for the community. It needs to change every day. We have new deals every day, which means that it's much more complex than a regular e-commerce. That's also why we cannot do standard solutions. Good, because then we can build code, right? And a branded deals, that only you get when the site is better, right? So this is giving a lot of direction to what we do. But we still weren't there yet. That wasn't enough, right? So when I got there, what happened? Because there were so many different little systems, all run in different departments. Everyone on tech was basically working for different departments. They didn't speak to each other. They were not a team, right? And to be able to move towards the dub, we, we gave it some settings, right? We said, well, we're going to work for 70% on our time to reach towards um, our strategic goal. We're going to spend 20% of the time adding features to the current software. 
because people still like to do that, right? It actually keeps people, well, happy, basically, in the company, and we use 10% of our time to keep it running. That does mean when questions come in into the latter category, we've already spent that time, and it's a little bit like this, but um, we're not going to do it. So there's a feature request in, in the second degree that a guy came up seven weeks ago. It was voted again and again and again. We, we didn't do it. And he's like, why didn't you do it? I said, well, there was more important stuff to do. And that is nice. And the good thing about this strategy is that we as tech can only spend our time once, right? And there's always more work than we can handle. So by setting this, it basically allowed us to move forward towards the dot again. And we do it in three steps. So for the strategic stuff, we do this. We set up a tech board with some people in it that come from the business and from tech. And everything, every issue, everything that comes in, like uh, we're currently building a new checkout as an example. After that, we're going to rebuild the profile stuff. And then we're going to reach out to France as a country. We already know this, right? Everything that comes into the tech board, we ask, does it help us to reach the goal, right? Get towards the dot on the horizon. Can we actually do this? Is it a stupid idea or is it too big or whatever, right? Um, if we can, well, we ask the question, is it too big? Um, if it's not too big, we'll put it on the board. And then the next question is, do we really need this now? If not, we'll put it on the Sunday maybe column. If it's on the Sunday maybe column, we revisit it in like three to four months, that's it. That's how it works. Here's a, a screenshot of the tech board from a couple of weeks ago. So it, this is where we actually, we just integrated new coupon implementation. We're building a new basket that's done by now, replacing directory done, home page done, vertical page. This is all done, right? This is from a couple of weeks ago. So it moves on. And yes, this is Jira. I'm not saying use Jira. It's an example, right? So <laughs> maybe you should, maybe you shouldn't. So the next step is actually the 20%. The it has a similar board. They have a weekly meeting with the general board, which actually took place on Monday this week. Uh, the tech board meeting is actually now, um, um, cause, but I'm here. But um, on the general board, they do smaller stuff, and they vote for it. But we can only spend like 20% of our time on this, which means they only get a few requests. That means that the business is going to decide which one of the 20,000 things they want they actually going to get through. And that makes the business responsible. They are now part of our ecosystem, basically. And the last thing we use a Slack channel for that is where we do, it's called Ask Tech. You can ask any stupid question you want, and we'll try to answer it if it sticks within the 10%. This allows us to focus on reaching towards the dot and breaking stuff into work that we can actually do. And that is a really, really big step if you're coming out of the, uh, the technical depth. So we're going to move into shorter cycles. So as I asked, <laughs> uh, you do Scrum, right? So the question I always see when I look on the internet is, uh, um, what, what happens if a Scrum project fails? Now, the people from the Scrum community will then always say, you're not doing Scrum right. Have you heard that question? Have you heard that? Right? Yeah, we're all not doing Scrum right, by the way. There is no way to do this thing right. So I, I looked it up on the internet yesterday. I'm like, oh, yeah, people saying, yeah, you're doing Scrum right. Here's how to do it right. Everybody has opinions about this, right? Or, um, are you really doing Scrum? Follow these guidelines to be sure. By the way, these guidelines and this article here, they weren't the same, actually. They had different guidelines. Or like, um, is it okay to skip events from Scrum? Right? No, wrong. It's not wrong, by the way. This is stupid. <laughs> or like this, right? This, um, um, uh, what does it say? Um, Scrum provides an empirical foundation for teams, which enable them to move frequently, developer, uh, frequently deliver higher value products. Um, and you should follow the framework. Everybody should follow the framework, right? Uh, and um, also like the Scrum master, he's like the master of the universe. Um, um, I, I think they'll, they'll make up a Marvel hero called Scrum Master or something with a cape and stuff. I think that should be good, by the way. So uh, he's a leader, a coach, a mentor, and a trainer. Pfft. And a lots of other things, by the way, too, right? This is impossible. Uh, also, this is a nice quote. It says, um, changing the core ideas of Scrum, leaving out elements, or not following the rules of Scrum, there's rules, covers up problems and limits the benefits of Scrum. This is easy, right? So if you, if you don't follow the rules that they set, you're not doing it right. And if it fails, it's your own fault. And this, by the way, this last quote, it comes from the Scrum Guide, which is a 14-page booklet describing you how the world runs. So the question is, is that the right approach? And my answer is, nope, it's not. 
There is no single default Scrum implementation that just works because Scrum isn't enough, basically. Also, you can still do failing projects if you do everything right in Scrum. These are the burn down charts from a project I visited in Belgium some 10 years ago, right? Um, this is the first iteration or sprint. They had work left in the end, right? And the second one, and the third one, and then the project manager, they had a project manager. He said, you're stupid because you cannot estimate Right? You, you've heard that before, right? <laughs> so um, how long does it take to finish the project? We don't know, because we are in the chaotic and complex zones. How can we tell? We have to experiment, right? So it didn't work. He hired 300 people from some country across the ocean, and um, they still couldn't make work. The project manager was fired. The project was killed. It was actually their building. <laughs> they were building software for a nuclear power plant. <laughs> Pretty cool stuff, right? <laughs> so anyway, it failed, right? And they were still doing everything right in the book. And the thing is, it doesn't really matter, actually, because nobody should care, right? You should care whether you are agile, and I'll come to that. You should not care whether you're compliant with the Scrum Guide, because it doesn't really matter, because Scrum is not agile, and agile is not Scrum. Agile, according to my good friend, Alan, is basically, it's not a process. It's not a framework. Agile is the ability to create your own process, which is tailored to what you need to do, which is not exactly what the Scrum Guide describes. So instead of asking, um, uh, we're not doing Scrum, right? We should ask, we're not doing Scrum, right? That's the comma for all. It's, but we do want rapid feedback. Right? That's what they promote, is rapid feedback. So what you should really do is moving towards even shorter cycles. Because the shorter the cycles are, the sooner you get the feedback, the better you are. Um, and that goes a long way, right? I, I'm an old guy, right? So I started my uh, work in this industry when there was still waterfall that had a single pass, like three to five year project. They were doomed to fail. They all failed, by the way. And then we got into stuff like rational unified process and the unified process and lots of other processes that we had in the 90s. Lots of diagrams too, lots of UML. Uh, and um, well, they're basically like four to six month iterations. Then we went into DSDM in the early 90s, right? And that was four to six week iterations. And then people invented like stuff like Scrum and we went to, 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 to two to four weeks. Or if you uh, prefer like me to do XP, then you got XP. But we got over that because the technology in the industry got so far that we could do much more. And that means we can actually deliver many times per day. My team actually put stuff into production about 40 to 50 times per day, all the time, right? To be able to do that, you have to do a lot of stuff, right? You start delivering value continuously, which means you take the small items and you actually put them to work. Um, and that is basically what Jess Humble also says, right? So basically, continuously lever means um, if it hurts, do it more frequently. Because there's lots of pain in putting stuff out there and releasing stuff. And the smaller you can make stuff, the less the pain is, right? If you have like um, one release every three months, it's terrible because the delta is so big that you can never get it tested, let alone put it into production. So this is a very slow process and eventually leading to technical depth. Because the delta is getting bigger and bigger, and the distance behind where you are, uh, where you want to be, is getting bigger and bigger too. Instead, you could also look into, I'll skip this one because this is just about dependencies. Uh, you could just do like small changes all the time, right? We can do continuous delivery of items into production. To be able to do that, you need to automate everything, which is a lot of work, right? This is where the DevOps uh, people come into play. Um, and Edgar Deming already said it. He said, well, we need to seize dependence on inspection to achieve quality, right? Everything you do after you deliver, even after you checked in the code into your repo, is too late, right? That goes for peer reviews too, right? Peer reviews are a too late mechanism. You need to do it before you check in the code, right? That means you need to start working together instead of working separately. And he says, well, eliminate the need for massive inspection, peer reviews, whatever you do, pull requests, by building quality into the production in the first place. That's why we do trunk-based development. That's why we try to work together most of the time. And I'm not saying it's wrong not to, it's just more efficient to do so. But you need full CI CD. That means every change in my code base goes into production if it passes all the tests. And they go a long way, all these tests, right? Because, well, there's tests everywhere. That also means that all your infrastructure becomes code. 
we have nothing physically running anywhere, right? If something, whatever in our landscape breaks down these days, it'll come up automatically. It's in the cloud somewhere, et cetera, et cetera. Right, so that you all need to do. The same goes for testing. Testing also is a big thing in here because testing actually can also slow you down because if you do a lot of manual testing, a lot of companies still do a lot of manual testing, it's too slow. If it takes four days to run all the tests, and I've been in situations like this, it's too slow because you cannot get stuff through the pipeline uh, for faster than four days. You need to turn that around. You need to start looking into your unit tests all the time. You should unit test. Who of you has written unit tests this week? That's too few people. That's way, way too few. Or you haven't written any code this week. That's also a possibility, but... Uh, <laughs> but oh, a year ago, wow. <laughs> Ooh. Well, I need to catch my breath now. Like a year ago, it's really long, right? So I cannot do it. I code so long. So anyway, so you need to start doing that, right? And, and testing is part of your pipeline. It's everywhere. These are all the tests we run before something gets into production. And that is unavoidable if you want to have shorter cycles. But in the end, it does mean you can actually code with a lot of confidence. By the way, you can see why he's praying. Um, he has his um, ID running in light mode. You don't do that, right? So um, that's the point. So test everything, automate everything, and keep your cycles as short as you can, right? And that is shorter than two or four weeks. So the next step, that's about teams. Now, Dijkstra was right. Dijkstra was always right, by the way, but he says, well, the programmer has to be able to think in terms of conceptual hierarchies that are much deeper than a single mind ever needed to face before. He's basically saying in 1984, 1986, I don't know actually, uh, uh, that this industry has gotten so complex that we are unable to handle it. And you all know that, right? So this is the stack of one of my previous clients. They had 25 developers. Yes. They had 25, they needed to maintain all of this stuff. Um, the, the quick conclusion was they couldn't. They just couldn't keep up and they, their cycles got longer and longer and longer and longer because they wanted to be able to do this all. And the only thing that I realized over time in this industry is that there's so much I don't know about, right? There's people on my team who are much better at a lot of stuff than I am. I was looking into um, <laughs> uh, reactiveness of React components this morning with a uh, uh, guy I work with, uh, Jeroen, and Jeroen said, oh, you need to do it like this and this and this. I'm like, what? Why didn't I see this? And I was looking at it for two hours already. Don't wait too long before asking somebody, because in software development, it's, that's Jeroen, by the way, on the left, it's not the individual that does the work, it's the team that does the work, right? The team is the smallest unit of ownership in software development. It's not a person. You cannot, in this complex industry, make individual people responsible or accountable even for this kind of stuff. It's always the team, right? So you need to think about how these teams can work together. And we figured it out. It took me a long time to get to these patterns that we found, uh, and, and they sort of match with the tech board stuff, et cetera, et cetera, because what we figured out is that we are basically as a team, we're collective. That means, and this is a phenomenal jazz uh, uh, band, and they, they can play in any setup, right? Um, either the pianist Greg Meldo plays on his own, or Brian Blade plays with the, with the bass player, I always forget his name, or they play all four of them or three of them in different setups. They can do stuff, right? And that is pretty much how we pick it up too. Because if the work comes from the tech board, which is really high level, it's like build a new checkout, right? Okay. Let's see how we can do this. And then we start splitting it up ourselves. It's nobody's business but us. And we have people on the team that know all sorts of stuff, right? We have people that know about TypeScript, about React, about GCP. This is a different setup, I suppose. We know about our ERP system, which is written in Python. We know a lot about MongoDB. We know no, lots of stuff, right? But nobody knows everything. But the nice thing is, if you break stuff down, you don't have to know everything. By the way, here's some pictures of collectors being in work. Um, no, let's just skip them, not very interesting. Because everybody can decide for themselves. To be able to do that, that requires a lot of autonomy. Autonomy means that you get to choose, as a team, what to do, how to do, when to do it. Right? So I couldn't care less on my team where the people work in the weekends, in the evenings, or go to the swimming pool on Wednesday. That's all fine, as long as they feel that they take the responsibility with the rest of the team. But autonomy is really tough, because for a lot of people, especially in larger organizations I've seen, it's, it's sort of out of your comfort zone. 
right? Um, when I first started doing this with my current team, there were people on my team said, yeah, but, but so in the morning, what do you want us to do? And I'm like, what, what do you want to do? And I'm like, I don't know. I want to either work on ERP or work on the TypeScript stuff. So what do you think? And I think, I, I said, well, you need to think about this. And that takes a long time. And the problem is, for me as the manager, I hate the word, but I'm not a manager, by the way, but um, I just write code, but people, is, it's basically like this. You cannot teach people how to be autonomous because you can just say, be autonomous and give them some hints and ask them some questions and guide them along the way. But that's basically it so far as I can find. What I did find, by the way, is that it does help to have fewer rules. So if you set some boundaries and you let everybody free within those boundaries, you can go a long way. This is uh, Alexander Plain here in the city. Um, at one point in time, they removed all the traffic signs from the square just to figure out what would happen. They do a nice experiments here in Amsterdam, right? One of the larger um, car arteries of the city, they blocked it now. The Weesperstraat is blocked. It's really cool, actually. And, and you see the traffic going all sorts of directions through town. They are blocking those streets as well. It's a pretty cool experiment. We do that stuff here in Amsterdam, right? So, uh, but they removed all the signs. What happened is that people needed to start communicating with each other about how to get across to the other side. Whether you're a bicyclist or a pedestrian, um, the only thing you need to take care of is that if a BMW crosses, you're doomed, right? So you just wait. That's the only rule. Um, so that means that people had to collaborate in traffic to get across this particular square. That is really cool, right? That is actually what works. And we got to the point that we say, well, um, when we start breaking this stuff down, um, we can actually focus on just solving one puzzle per day. The puzzle I'm currently solving is I'm, I'm making um, a grid with an infinite scroll in it. So if I push in a bunch of data and I have an item card, that I can scroll it down and it picks up the next bunch of stuff from the database or from the microservice actually, and it just scrolls down. And I wanted to make that into a component because we use that a lot, right? That's what I was doing this morning. That's the puzzle I'm solving today. Other people are now solving puzzles like how do we integrate Insider, which is a marketing tool, into our mobile app? That's also a puzzle that we're solving today. Or having the FAQs out in German, that's also a puzzle we're solving today. These are all small puzzles. And the nice thing about having these small puzzles is that from these larger collectives, none of these puzzles that, we've, uh, um, um, that we work on at the same point in time require the same skills, which means we can pick up a bunch of these puzzles at the same time, and we split ourselves up into what I tend to call micro-teams. Um, and there, there's a very simple recipe for that. Um, and I, I was writing a book about this three years ago. I stopped writing it because I, I'm happy writing code and less happy writing books. But um, so this is this is what we do basically. And we don't do this very um, very deliberate. We do this. It's it's like it just happens after some time. So every time somebody picks up a puzzle, they're like, oh yeah, okay, I'm going to pick up this puzzle. And then somebody else might say, oh, you know what, I'll join you because I'm really interested in this. So for instance, there's now two people experimenting with React Native and refactoring the components we have there because they're interested in that. And that's all good, right? As long as it leads us towards the dot on the horizon, we're all good. And because we deliver, we keep on being good. The former team discuss the work, do the work, report is done, check the code in, done. And then they did the same thing for the next item, whether that's the next day or two days after, three days after, or three in a day. It's up to the team itself, right? And I'll give you some examples of that, right? Here's like uh, an ops guy and a developer uh, working together on it, uh, on an item. Um, here is uh, my current team, actually. Um, so um, since Nafal is in there, it's probably really complex. You can see it from Francisco's eyes. Um, must be a really complex piece of work, right? So, um, uh, or uh, this is also nice. These are two developers and a tester. Um, the tester, of course, has to stand. Yeah, you sh that's why you became a tester, right? So, uh, by the way, I heard that standing is healthy for you yesterday, but you should also walk, by the way. So, um, and then there's uh, an architect and a developer, right? Uh, you can see this guy on the left is the architect because he's praying for it to work. The developer already knows it doesn't, right? So that's, I'm like, no, nah, probably not. And um, <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so, and, and this is a really nice technique. And the funny thing is, if you give people enough autonomy, they'll start doing this automatically. People on my team, they work with different other people every day. And it's kind of cool, and we share knowledge throughout the team. And I have, don't have to tell anybody anymore what to do. I refuse to do that anyway, by the way. And the nice thing is, it seems to scale too. 
I didn't realize that. I put stuff on it, and it was really nice because uh, uh, Marcin from ING, he was looking into one of my codes, actually here in the next room a couple of years ago, and he said, oh, you're, I'm going to try this out at ING. And then I pushed, put a post up on LinkedIn and said, well, I don't really, people ask me if it's scaled, and I said, well, I don't really care much about where it scales. I like working for small companies. And then Marcin said, no, 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 we actually make it scale. Uh, and it works, they call it micro squats. They actually did a talk about this in this room last year. Um, they did have my picture up in the talk. That's pretty cool, actually. Um, and he still, he still owns me a cup of coffee, by the way. So I'm not sure if Marcin's here, but um, I haven't seen him so far. But anyway, so this is a nice technique, and it just works. Which brings us to the last um, subject of the talk. And it's about smaller components. And you're all thinking, but I'm already building small components. Well, you might be, right? You could be. So in our case, um, for the last decade, every company that I went to, I started breaking stuff into smaller items, smaller components, because smaller components are easier to deliver separately uh, and are much easier to work on with smaller teams. So we delve into microservices. Um, the project that we did at the insurance company started in 2014. It was the first microservices project in the Netherlands. It took four and a half years. But we got rid of the 30 million lines of code. What remained were 150 small components that together had 350,000 lines of code, more or less. Um, that is, was pretty awesome, actually. So there's lots of debates about microservices these days. Because Amazon, Amazon Prime Video, now decided to throw their uh, AWS servers under a bus. Which immediately, this is like two weeks ago, right? Immediately led to a flood of articles saying, oh, microservices are dead, let's go back to the monolith. That wasn't what AWS was doing, by the way. There was one group that got rid of one service. That doesn't make it all bad. It's not like Scrum, right? So, um, and now, yeah, the death of microservices, and now nobody's trying to do microservices. Now, everybody's now afraid of doing microservices, right? So, uh, but it's not that bad, right? Microservices are not yet dead. No, neither is any of the other architectural styles, right? Service-oriented architecture is still, or component-based development is still out here, and even monolithical applications are still out there. It depends, basically, on what your needs are. The nice thing is, there is no best practice in this, right? There is no single architectural pattern, design pattern, that works everywhere. Because they all work within their own context. So at best, there are good practices in this industry. It's not like if we have a nut, we know what screwdriver to pick or what um, appliers to pick. We're not there yet in this industry. That also, of course, raises the question whether we are actually engineers or researchers or whatever. But um, th the thing is, they do tend to get the good practice into the same direction. Let me show you some. This is very old, coupling and cohesion, right? You try to do the one more and the other less, right? So less coupling, higher cohesion, meaning the things that belong together, that change together, you put them together. That doesn't mean you put all the repositories in one big library and all the gateways in one other and all the UI components in one other, because that doesn't break the dependencies. Um, if you look further, um, when the Unix philosophy was, philosophy was written, I think in 1976, they say exactly the same thing, right? They say you write programs that do one thing and do that one thing well. Um, and the same goes for the single responsibility principle. It says exactly the same thing. Make stuff smaller and put it in a way that you can actually handle it, basically, and that you can respond to the change in one of your components. So if you meet, like, Python files that have 352 lines of code, this is probably not very much single responsibility or Unix-like or a high coupling, of a high cohesion and low coupling, right? This is just doomed to, re to be refactored. And the thing is, we ended up in a microservices architecture. Now, the problem with microservice architecture is that it is highly complex. So it has a bunch of benefits, like it scales a lot better. So if you have scaling issues, by the way, not everybody has them. Um, or if you want to spread out stuff in smaller deployable units, yes, that is a good architecture choice. But it also has a lot of complexity. Um, and Martin Fowler, in his like short definition, um, he's, he's very precise about it. Right? You need to take care of all of this stuff before you can get it out or actually while you are getting it out, right? Because you need to take small steps here as well. And um, um, he's right about one thing, right? Microservices revolve around business capabilities. Now, there's lots of discussion about what is the actual granularity of a microservice. And again, that is different for everybody. 
Um, I had a big discussion two weeks ago on the internet, on LinkedIn, I think, about what the actual granularity and size of microservice was. And somebody said, it's, it's the boundaries, right? So it's, it's the bounded context. Every bounded context becomes a microservice. And I had that same impression a decade ago. We started off doing this because we had no idea 10 years ago, right? This is all chaotic context. Um, and we figured it out that we like, if you have this big unified model, whether it's a data model, domain model, your big system, if any change in this really, really big model um, um, comes true, it probably affects everything else in your system. If you have an architecture like that, and I worked for companies that had that, that had like, they show me, I got into a company and they said, could you, could you help us out a bit? We're stuck, we're at um, uh, um, technical death. And, uh, and, and they said, okay, show me your model. And they show me the data model. Well, I thought, well, they would show me the data model. They opened up. Physio, I think it was, or something other, something terrible anyway. So, and, and the screen was all black. I'm like, so what am I seeing? And they said, well, it's a data model. I said, I don't see anything. They said, wait, wait, we'll zoom in. <laughs> and they zoomed in and zoomed in and zoomed in. And eventually I saw tables, right? So any change in any one of those tables broke the system. They couldn't even rename a single field anymore, right? They were doomed to die. They ceased to exist, by the way. So what does domain-driven design say? It actually says, break this stuff down into what is called bounded context. Now, in a bounded context, every bounded context has a ubiquitous language, which means everything inside of a bounded context has one meaning and exactly one meaning. That is why the product class here, the product thing here, Actually, there's two of them. One of them is about replenishment, and the other is about people ordering stuff. It's not the same thing, although in a data model, people say, yes, but it's all product, right? Which means that your product thing will have a lot of responsibilities in any one of the bounded contexts that you could put it in. So we started splitting this up. And then we realized it's not enough, because putting everything within a ubiquitous language in one component still were quite big components. So then we took a next step. The next step was we looked at aggregates, also a pattern from the DDD book, of course, by the way, which is tough to read. So there's good summaries of that, and you can ask chat to talk about it, of course. And um, the aggregate step is basically the next step. You can actually say within each of these bounded contexts, there are areas that are actually changing together, right? Remember changing together? That is single responsibility, right? They change together. We also save them usually together. At that point in time, you've reached the level of aggregates. Every bounded context has a bunch of them. Whether that's one or a bunch of them, that doesn't really matter. Could be any number of them. And, and the nice thing is, what we realize is that every one of these aggregates is a very nice candidate to be put into a microservice with a single API and an aggregate route that is the only one that is reachable from the outside. If you look in the book and you read the aggregate and the aggregate route patterns, you will recognize that it matches the structure of APIs really well, actually. So that's where we went. So for us, actually, um, we, we took it a little step further, right? Um, um, uh, we also start doing this in our applications, because if you break down um, um, your domain into services with an API, and you still build a big website on top of it, or whatever system you're building on top of it, you still have the same dependencies, because these are still all connected. So all the parts that are separated out into your microservices still are connected. So the best thing to do here is to also take that up a notch. And we started looking into implementing business processes. So this is like seven years ago that we started doing this, right? And we realized that if you look at a typical e-commerce uh, company, I think it's quite nice because I'm now working for an e-commerce company. I've been using these examples for tons of years in, in, uh, in courses and stuff, and now I actually work for e-commerce. You know, the world is a lot more complex in an actual e-commerce company than it is in all the examples that I've seen in the last 40 years. I didn't know that. So you select a product, you put it in your cart. You select another product. Well, you go off and you go to your shipping cart or, um, or your basket. Um, you check it out. You register yourself. You register your credit card. And then you show the order that you've actually placed. Pretty much a simple e-commerce project, right? So, and they all still talk to the services at hand. But what we did, instead of looking into making this big web application, we also split those up into what we call micro-applications. That means any one of these applications has their own aggregate. They own their own aggregate, usually comprised of parts of the aggregates down below, but they have their own unique aggregate, which also means that we can deploy and release them independently. I'm actually building a categories app now for our marketing teams, um, and that is going to be released independently. And so, 
the last thing about it is about continuous deployment, right? So to be able to do this, you need to have your CI CD in place. That means all your pipelines need to be there. They need to be there for each and every repo. So every microservice has its own repo, its own test, its own pipeline. So we have like 150 different pipelines by now. That means you have to put it out into infrastructure as well. But, but it does help us reach the goal of solving a single project problem every day because they're so small that we actually can release tons of those per day. So the delta has become really, really slow. So basically to round it up in one minute, says Adele, and um, um, we are on the left side of this diagram, right? That is valid for most of us. That means you have to learn how to experiment. Experimentation means that it's better to break stuff off into much smaller features so you can experiment them individually outside of the rest, isolated, you do it in even shorter cycles, right? Our cycle length isn't set, but it's sometimes even less than 10 minutes because we just build something, works, get it out there, done, right? That's the cycles you need. You need to make them much, much shorter because you need to keep up with the competition who's already way ahead of you in the end of this dilemma. You do that with smaller teams if we're inside of a collective. That's what we do, right? This is still me sharing stuff, what we do. And you build much smaller components. So I give you a hint of my team. This is my team, including me, by the way. Um, and that's Francisco without a beard. That's a really rare sight, by the way. Argentinians without a beard. But, um, uh, and this is what we don't do, right? We don't do Scrum. We don't do Kanban. We figured out our own process, which works quite nicely for us. We have no sprints, no Scrum Master, no product owner, no stories. We don't do estimations. Nobody in my team has ever seen a story point before, right? I hope. Uh, we don't do retros. We have no, nothing of this stuff. And it works for us, by the way, right? So we are able to solve the single problem every day. By the way, in order to do this, you can never, ever, ever stop learning. Uh, this is my team here yesterday or the day before. Uh, and somebody asked him, uh, do you guys actually do what Sander says you do? <laughs> That's a good question, by the way. Trick question, of course. And, and they looked at me and they said, should we say yes? No, 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 they just said yes, I think. Sort of. <laughs> Doesn't really matter. By the way, last thing is, never ever forget to have fun because we are in the best industry out there in the world. Right? There's nothing that beats writing software to me. Um, and that's it. I'm a little bit over time, I think, but um, I hope you indulge me for that. So thank you for being here. Enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>